Okay. Welcome back, everyone, to our second lecture today on Revelation and Daniel. We are going to continue uh, from Revelation chapter 20. So where we have reached so far in Revelation 19, we saw there is the marriage supper of the Lamb happening in heaven. And right after that, the Lord comes, the Lord Jesus comes. So you and I, you and I will be coming with Jesus. So remember that uh, at this time, at this time, the church has already been taken up into heaven. We already have our resurrected, glorified bodies as saints of God. And there are also the saints who were killed during the seven year tribulation. Okay. So all the saints till the beginning of the tribulation have received glorified bodies. They are up in heaven now. Seven years of tribulation. There are more saints. That means more people have believed in Jesus who have died during the tribulation. When the Lord is coming in the in heaven, with, with the armies of heaven, there are those, there are of course the angels of God, but there are all the saints who have received glorified bodies coming with him. And what will happen is, all those who have died during the seven year tribulation, the, those who have died believing in Christ, they will be resurrected and they will receive glorified bodies. So that means at the end of the tribulation, when Jesus is setting up his kingdom on the earth, every saint, every person who believed in Jesus Christ and died or who is alive up until that time is going to receive glorified bodies. Every person who, let me correct myself, Every person who believed and died in Christ is going to receive glorified bodies. Now, there will also be people at the end of the tribulation who, you know, who, who are coming through the tribulation, who will enter the thousand year reign of Christ, the millennial reign of Christ. They will enter in as natural people because they won't have glorified bodies. But there will be the saints of God who have glorified bodies, meaning these bodies will not die. So they will be there. So you have two kinds of people in the millennium. You have people with glorified bodies. You have people with their natural bodies coming into the millennium. And Jesus sets up his kingdom here on earth and he will rule and reign on the earth for 1,000 years. During this 1,000 years, Satan is going to be taken out of the picture. He's going to be bound, taken out during this 1,000 year period. Christ is going to rule and reign on the earth. So we read about this now in Revelation chapter 20. We will look at verses 1 through 6. And parallel passages that describe life in the millennium are found in Isaiah, specifically Isaiah chapter 11. Uh, chap sorry, chapter 2, chapter 11, and chapter 65. Three chapters from the book of Isaiah that describe what the millennium or the thousand year reign of Christ will look like. Right? So let's read, please, Isaiah, uh, Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 6. Can somebody read that for us, please? Aaron? Yeah, sure, Pastor. <clears throat> then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding his holding in his hand the key of the appears, appears and a heaven and a heavy chain. He sees the dragon, that ancient serpent, that is the devil or Satan, and chain and chain it him up for a thousand years the angel threw him into the abyss locked it and sealed it so that he could not deceive the nations anymore until the thousand years were were over after that he must be let loose for a little while then i saw thrones and those who sat on them were given the power to judge i saw the souls 
of those who had been executed because they had proclaimed the truth that Jesus revealed and the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or its image, nor had received the mark of the beast on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and ruled as kings with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the de de uh, dead did not come to life until the thousand years were over. This is the first raising of the dead, happy and greatly blessed. And those who are included in their first raising of the dead, the second death has no power over them. They shall be priests of God and of Christ, and they will rule with him for a thousand years. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, here we are having a, a clear description. Uh, not all the details, but it's telling us what will happen during this, or how this whole thousand years uh, is going to be set up. So, he's telling us that, first of all, Satan is going to be bound into the bottomless pit or the abyss for 1,000 years. Satan is taken out of the picture. Then we are seeing that uh, the people who refuse to receive the mark of the beast during the tribulation, they are going to be resurrected. That's verse 4. So they are going to have glorified bodies. They're going to be resurrected. And they, uh, along with us, the saints of God, we're going to rule with Christ. We're going to reign with Christ for a thousand years. And um, um, so that, that's referred to as the first resurrection. It means the resurrection being raised, to those who are being raised right after the tribulation. It's referred to the first. We have been raised just prior to the uh, the the the, uh, the beginning of the tribulation. He's taken the church out of the way. And now here the rest are raised up after the tribulation and, and they're raised up here so we will be as priests of god and of christ and will reign with him a thousand years we will reign with christ one thousand years now what would life look like during this one thousand years i'll be referred to it as the millennial reign of christ now the lord god is fulfilling you know what he's spoken uh, in uh, Isaiah chapter 9 the, his, the government will verse 6, you know, the government will be on his shoulder so this is this is the literal fulfillment of that, that means Christ is ruling, the government is on his shoulder, he is king so he is ruling from Jerusalem and so here when you look at some parallel passages which I mentioned, Isaiah chapter 2 Isaiah chapter 11 Isaiah chapter 65, you also look at Daniel chapter 7, it talks about the saints possessing the kingdom. Uh, the Apostle Paul wrote about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. He said, don't you know that we will judge the world? Or we, the saints will judge the angels. Yeah, so we are ruling here with Christ. We're helping, ad we are administering his kingdom. So during this uh, thousand year period, We will administer Christ's kingdom on the earth. Life will go on. Isaiah 65 talks about people being born, uh, you know, and uh, life happening, which is they're building buildings, planting vineyards, and so on. I mean, life is going to go on here on earth for 1,000 years. But the nature of things will be very different because God, God is going to transform the nature of things. So now Isaiah describes it saying, the lion will lie down with the lamb. A child will, you know, play with the serpent, so to speak. Meaning the, the very, the nature of things is going to be changed during this thousand year reign. They will beat their swords into plowshares. That means that they're not going to learn war. They want to be, they're not going to be fighting. Satan is taken out of the way, right? So life is going to be very, very different. The very nature of things, the evil is not going to be there in the sense of, the sin and the, and the wickedness that was there, that's taken out. 
So, uh, you know, we have these descriptions given to us in these passages, uh, which I'd encourage you to read, Isaiah chapter 2, 11, 65, and, and also Zechariah chapter 14, and also Daniel chapter 7, which we read through. Okay? And uh, we will, the saints will be teaching people about the kingdom, about Jesus Christ and the kingdom. Why? Because we will have people coming through the tribulation, the natural people, right? That means they're still in the natural bodies. And so they will be able to procreate. They will, you know, the, the multitudes will, there will people be born during the millennium reign. And so the human race will be multiplying. And, and, and those of us, the saints, will be teaching them about God. And so nations will say, let us go up to the uh, house of God. Let us learn about his ways, teach us his ways. So nations will begin to flow together into Jerusalem to learn about Jesus Christ and so on. And so all of that will be happening during the millennium, the thousand year reign of Christ. These are some of the insights that we have now given to us in scripture. But now, at the end of the thousand years, something happens. And we read about this from verse 7, Revelation 20, verse 7 onwards. Satan is released for a brief moment at the end of the thousand years, released back on the earth. So Satan and his demons are released back on the earth. They have been taken out of the earth for 1,000 years. Satan and the demons have been taken out. Now they're released back on the earth. And they go about to deceive the nations, meaning people. They go about to deceive people once again. Not the saints, not the ones who have glorified bodies, but the natural people who have you know, been born, who are alive at that time. And uh, it tells us that they gather these people towards battle. And once again, Gog and Magog are mentioned here. Gog and Magog. We read about, we read about them in Ezekiel 38 uh, as, as leaders of, uh, of, you know, what would we would say as modern day Russia and those parts of, of, of the earth. Now it's their names come up here again in Revelation 20 verse 8, Gog and Magog. But that doesn't mean they are the only people who are going to uh, join with um, uh, Satan at that time, but it says there's going to be great number of people who will be deceived and who will join with Satan and they will actually go against the, the camp of God. But God once again intervenes and this time everything is wrapped up with the great white throne judgment. So let's read about that in Revelation chapter 20 verses 7 through 15, please. Somebody could read that, Revelation chapter 20, verses 7 through 15. I'll read past. Go ahead, Thomas. Now, when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is is the sand of the sea. They went up the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast of their false prophets are and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. The great white throne judgment. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged according to their works. By the things which were written in the books, the sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and the hates delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged. 
each one according to his works. Then death and hates were cast into the lake of fire. There is a second death, and anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Mm. So, as we said, Satan. Thank, thank you, Thomas. Um, Satan is released for a brief moment at the end of this thousand-year reign of Christ. Now, again, you know, we I think we discussed this in our second year course, and uh, you know, we try to think on reasons why God would want to or God plans to release Satan on the earth. Uh, obviously, he succeeds in deceiving the nations because it says uh, uh, the number of people who join him is like the sand of the sea. This shows us how how strong. Satan's decept tactics for deception are he can deceive people, right? So even at the end of the millennium, he, he, is, he succeeds in deceiving people. He succeeded in deceiving Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden when there was no sin and they were in the presence of God. And once again, he succeeds in deceiving people at the end of the millennium. And his tactic of deception is just similar. He gets people to question what God has promised. In the Garden of Eden, he said, did God really say? Questioning what God had said. And I'm sure that even here at the end of the, seven, at the millennium, when he goes out to deceive the nations, he's probably going to use a similar tactic. Did Jesus really say that you're going to go into new heavens and the new earth? Did Jesus really say, you know, he's going to get them, he's going to deceive them by getting them to doubt what God had spoken. That's his all, that's his tactic. Question what God has spoken. Get people to question. Right? So that's his this uh, tactic for deception, which he, you know, uses against believers even today. You know, he gets us to question what God has promised. So uh, he deceives the people. They go up against Jerusalem, against the city, the beloved city. But God intervenes with fire. And uh, Satan, his demons... They're all cast into the lake of fire. Now, this is the end of it. No more release, no more nothing. And then there is the great white throne judgment. So this is the final judgment. And the Bible says that every living person, this is verse 12, Revelation 20, verse 12, the dead, small and great, stand before the throne of God. That means every person from the time of Adam who lived on the earth, who was not, who has not been saved, will stand before the throne of God. And they will be judged. And whoever's name was not written in the Lamb's Book of Life will be cast into the lake of fire. So the lake of fire is the final destination for those who do not know Christ. In that lake, he says, death and Hades was cast. So death itself is no more. Hades, which was the place of the dead when people died, that is also cast in. I mean, everything is wrapped up now in the lake of fire. This is a second death or the final death. And then what happens? Only those who are saved are left on the earth. And momentarily, they are taken out of the earth. It's not described here, but I'm just filling this in because of the sequence of events. So people who are on the earth are taken away. And all the heavens and the earth are renovated. So the Bible talks about new heavens and the new earth. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 10 to 13, Peter says, you know, everything, heavens and the earth will be renovated by fire. So I can 
understand or we can say here that everything, this entire universe, this earth, God is going to just change everything. It's going to be renovated by fire, meaning the old will be gone. Nothing of the old. It's going to be new heavens and new earth. So Revelation chapter 21 and 22 talk to us about life or what will happen after this renovation has taken place. Second Peter chapter 3, 10 to 13 describe the renovation. Peter writes that everything will be renovated by fire so that everything in the past will be destroyed. So obviously, uh, I, I'm, so that's why I said, you know, we'll be taken out of the way, taken into heaven, so that this renovation can happen. And then heaven comes down onto the new earth. Okay, so we're going to read that in chapters 21 and 22. Aaron, I see uh, you've mentioned Hebrews 9, 27. You know, yeah, it's appointed to man once to die. After that, there will be the judgment. You have a question, Aaron? Okay. All right. So let's get into Revelation chapter 21. So this is after the renovation. Everything's been renovated with fire. New heavens, new earth. What's, what's it going to look like? Hmm? Revelation 21 verses 1 to 8, please. Somebody could read that for us. Revelation 21, 1 to 8. Verses 1 to 8, sorry. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride at dawn for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people god himself will be with them and be their god and god will weep away every tears from their eyes there shall be no more death no sorrow nor crying there shall be no more pain for the for uh, for the form form Former things. Former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all new, all things new. And he said to me, Write for this, words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirst he who overcomes shall inherit all things and i will be his god and he shall be my son but i but the cowardly unbelieving abominable murderer sexuality immoral sorcerers idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burn with fire and brim stone which is the second dead mm. okay thank you so john is saying the new heavens and the new earth so first heavens and the first heavens this entire universe which is today, which is referred to as the first heavens and the first earth, is passed away, is destroyed. And there's a new heaven and a new earth. I mean, it's a new universe. God puts it in place. It's been renovated. And this new heaven, new earth, there's no sea, no water. Right? That's There's no dependence on the natural water there's going to be the water of life. That means our life is going to be sustained from the life of God directly, the water of life. And um, on the earth, this new earth, comes 
heavenly city, Jerusalem. So the city of God, heavenly city, which means there is a city in heaven. That city, which has our mansions and the mansions that God has prepared for us and all of that, that heavenly city is transferred to the earth or relocated to this new earth. That's referred to as the new Jerusalem. And uh, in this new Jerusalem, now he's going to tell us a lot about the new Jerusalem you know, we have to, we, as we read on. But the first thing he says here is that this new Jerusalem is basically God dwelling with his people. So that's the first thing about this city. This is God dwelling with people. And God always wanted to dwell with people, with his people. People who are choosing to worship him, people who are, you know, choosing to do what he, you know, his, his, be like him, represent him, right? So the first thing about this heavenly, New Jerusalem, this heavenly city is, this is the place where God is dwelling with people on earth, just like how we wanted it from the very beginning. And uh, in this city, just like how he, be in the beginning, there's going to be no more death, no sorrow, no crying, no pain. All of that's gone. No, none of that. No death, no sorrow, no crying, no pain. The former things are passed away. All things are new. So God has done such an awesome work. All things are new. But I just want to highlight, you know, the very first thing about this new city is this. It's a tabernacle of God with man. It's God dwelling with man. Revelation 21, verse 3. God will be with them and be their God. And they will be his people. That's the heart of God. He wants to dwell with us. And this here is the fulfillment of what God really wants, what God is working towards, that God will dwell with man. And, you know, God says, verse 7, he will be our God and we will be his sons and daughters. Revelation 21, verse 7. And the others are forever separated. In the lake of fire. So let's continue reading a little bit more about this heavenly city, Jerusalem, and what is life going to be like in this new heavens and new earth. Verse 9 on which Revelation chapter 21. We are going to read verse 9, and uh, let's just read verse 9 to 13, please. Revelation 21, 9 to 13. Brent, you want to read? Oh. Then one of the seven angels, who had the seven bowls, filled with the seven last plagues, come to me and talked with me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. And he cried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, Descend, descending out of the heavens from God. Having the glory of God, her light was like a mount, precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as such still. Also, Christ. crystal. Also, she had a great and high wall with twelve gates and twelve angels and at the gates and names written on them which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of israel three gates on the east three gates on the north and three gates on the south and three gates on the west mm -hmm. till 2100 um just read um uh, uh, let's see now uh, uh, okay, let me just, we'll pause here, we're still verse 13, and then we'll continue afterwards. Eh? So, verse 9 to 13, Revelation 21, 9 to 13. Thank you, Prince. So, he's saying, yeah, the angel spoke, speaks to John, says, let me show you who is the bride. 
the lamb's wife and he shows him this city this great city the holy Jerusalem now keep in mind it's not just the city but the people who are in the city the people of God who are in that city they are the bride of Christ but they are living in this great city and what about this city he says this city is filled with the glory of God verse 11 so people God's people dwelling are living in this great city the holy Jerusalem and the glory of God saturates the city so imagine a city he has told us earlier that this is the place where God tabernacles with man God dwells with man so obviously people are there they are the bride of Christ and then they are in this great city they are saturated with the glory of God God's presence fills us and he tells us a little about the city it's got 12 gates and each the name of each gate is the name of the you know one of the tribes of Israel so the 12 tribes are going to be remembered forever by their names written on the gates of the city then let's pick up in verse 14 what else do we know what else does he tell us about the city verses 14 to 21 please Revelation 4, 21, verses 14, 21. Yeah. Now the wall of the city and 12 foundation and on uh, them were the, were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And he who worked with me had a gold rig to measure, to measure the city, its gates, its gates and its wall. The city is laid out a square. Square its length is a great as its breadth. And he measured the city with the rate twelve thousand uh, for long. Its length, breadth and height equal are equal. Then he measured its wall, 144 cubits, according to the measure of a man, that is, of an angel. The construction of its wall was of jasper, and the city was pure gold, like clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stone with first foundation was jasper the second sapphire the third caldoni the fourth uh, emerald the fifth sardonic the sixth sredius the seventh sar seri solid the eight valley, the ninth top, uh, topaz, the tenth sa, series of ah, uh, that's a... okay. Yeah, these are all the, that's okay. We will, all skip, we will skip the names of um, all, all of these um, um, precious stones and yeah, till verse 21. That's fine, okay. Then uh, and verse 21, the 12 gates were 12 pearls. Each individual gate was of one pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. Thank you. So these are all the details of uh, what the city is going to look like. So it's a square. The length, the width, and the, the height are about the same, are, are the same, he says. And, uh, you know, in verse 16, he gives us an idea, you know, uh, verse 15, he's talking about somebody, you know, the, the angel who has this golden reed to measure the city, just to give us an idea of the dimensions. So he says here, the city, uh, it's uh, 
12,000 furlongs, 12,000 furlongs. This is verse 16, Revelation 21, verse 16. And a note in my Bible, in the, in the, the margin says, that's 1,380 miles. So 12,000 furlongs is about uh, 1,380 or almost 1,400 miles. Now, um, I was just looking at, uh, you know, um, uh, the distance between India, uh, east to west, uh, which is around 1,800 miles east to west. So if you imagine India, our widest east to west point would be, which would some be something like, you know, from the northeast point to the west, the full length that way is about 1,800 miles approximately. Okay. Or if you go from the north to the south, our longest point from the north to the south is 1,000 997 or almost 2,000 miles. Now the city, the city is, the width of the city is almost like the width of India. Okay, so let's try to imagine. We're talking about not the width of a country, we're talking about the width of a city. The width of this new city, Jerusalem, one direction is almost from India, the, length, the width of India, coast to coast, I mean, end to end, from easternmost point to the westernmost point. That's just the width of the city. So that means you know, this city is like many, many, many cities put together. It's like a big country. You know? So that's, I just want us to understand that that this city, New City Jerusalem, is like a big country, okay? So it's it's not uh, a small city. You know, in our minds, when we think of cities, you know, you think of a uh, uh, city of Bangalore or something like that, you know, we, we, we have this idea, okay, there are cities like this, but this city, New Jerusalem, he says, the width is, is like the width of a country. Okay, then the length and the height. It's like that, meaning this is huge, huge. Okay, so although it's called the city Jerusalem, it's you have to think in terms of like a huge country, right? And then he says, you know, um, the wall and, and the city he's describing, he's using. Uh, the colors of precious stones to describe it is using um, uh, other things like gold and clear glass to describe the city. Meaning, this city is very, very magnificent. It's, you know, so John is just using precious stones and colors of precious stones to describe what he is seeing. It's, it's beyond what. Uh, what we can imagine itself. And he sums up by saying, I mean, he ends up by saying in verse 21, the gates are pearls and the street is pure gold. So can you imagine a city that's as wide as a country whose streets are gold, pure gold? It's, it's, it's so magnificent. And he mentioned earlier that the names of the apostles were on the 12 foundations. That's verse 14. So interesting. The 12 tribes and the 12 apostles are remembered in that new city, New Jerusalem. And the city is so magnificent, so great, beyond you know what we can imagine. Let's continue further, please. Um, we will just maybe read. Uh, we will read from verse 22 to 27. Revelation 21, 22 to 27, please. But I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. 
the city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it for the glory of the god illuminated it the lamp is its light and the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light and the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it its gate shall not be shut at all by day there shall be no light there and they shall bring the glory of the honor of the nations into it so 26 verse 27 yeah but there shall be no no means enter it anything that defiles or causes an a abomination or a lie but only those who are written in the lamb's book of life mm. so the city is the city where god himself is dwelling with his people so he says there in verse 22 the lord god almighty and the lamb are its temple so there's no need for a physical temple god himself is there god is dwelling in that city the glory of god is there i mean it's so hard to imagine a city that's as big as like a country people are and god is dwelling there and he says there's no need for sun and the moon and i mean there's none of this those kinds of there's no need for those kinds of things so the new heavens and the new earth are going to be very different uh than the first heavens and the first earth the first heavens the first earth which we are living in right now has all the sun the moon the stars planetary bodies you know i don't know what the new heavens and new earth are going to be like but he just tells us here there's no need for the sun or the moon god himself is dwelling here with us on the earth and all the king all the leaders of the people who were before leaders and great men on the earth they're all there in that city people of everyone who's been saved whose names are in the book of life they are in the city and they are here bringing they're just you know giving all glory honor to god himself beautiful picture so there's no evil no evil no wickedness in this city god almighty is dwelling his glory floods the city revelation 22 let's uh, let's maybe try to complete this and what time we have maybe so let's read revelation 22 please we could go from verses 1 to 11 revelation 22 1 to 11 then he showed me a pure river of water of life clear as a crystal proceeding from the throne of god and the lamb in the middle of its street and in either side of the river was the tree of life which bore 12 fruits each tree yielding its fruit every month the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations and there shall be no more curse but but the throne of god and of the lamb shall be in it and his servant shall serve him they shall see his face and his name shall be on their foreheads there shall be no night they no need lamp nor light of the sun for the lord god gives them a light and they shall reign forever and ever then he said to me those words are faithful and true and the lord god of the holy prophets sent his angel to show his servants the things which must shortly take place behold i am coming quickly blessed is the blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book now prophecy of this book now i john saw or heard these things and when i heard and saw i fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things then he said to me see that you don't you do not do that for i am your fellow servant and your brethren the prophets and those who keep the words of this book worship god and he said to me do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book for the time is is at hand he who is unjust let him be unjust still he who is filthy let him be filthy still he who is righteous let him be righteous still he who is holy let him be holy still mm 
So some more, uh, some more details about the city. There's a river, God, um, the throne of God. Uh, there's a river of the water of life. Now, remember, we, we just said earlier that, you know, we don't need, life is going to be very different. We don't need physical water and things like that. But so this is something different. It's the water of life. So there's a life of God is flowing from God to his people. And there's also the tree of life bearing fruit, and uh, which is for the health of the nation. So really, God's people are going to be walking in perfect health that is given to them by God himself, life and health flowing from God to his people. Right? So it's, it's pictured like this. And there's no curse, verse 3, no more curse. Remember? In the Garden of Eden, after man fell, there was a curse. There's going to be pain and sorrow and toil. None of that in this city. No more pain, no more sorrow, no more toil. Uh, life and health that flows from God himself. And um, we will see the face of God. We will see the face of God in, our, in that city. And he once again repeats you know there's no need for any physical light god himself is the light and we're going to rule that means we're going to be in a place of authority and dominion we're going to live like kings in this place sense of complete you know just describing to us that there's not going to be any form of being a slave or anything like that. Just, we're going to be like kings. That's how life is going to be. And then he says, verse 6, you know, these are things that are going to take place shortly. So think about this, you know, Revelation 22, verse 6, and also in verse 10, he says, the time is at hand. Things are near, it's going to happen. Now, I know it's been 2,000 years since John wrote this. But for God and for the way God sees it, he says, so I'm getting ready to wrap these things up and bring these things into what I have in mind. And he's just assuring us it'll all work out well. It'll all be fine. It'll all be fine. And we look at things today, it looks very distressing. It looks very perplexing. It looks very confusing. But you read the book of Revelation, God says, look, It'll all be fine. What I've planned will be fulfilled. God will dwell with his people. He will be their God, and they will see his face. What a glorious, glorious place it's going to be. So he encourages us. He says, you know, keep the words of this prophecy, and, and uh, I will come and worship God. Let's read the last part of this, Revelation 22. Somebody could read the final portion for us, verses 12 to 21. Revelation chapter 22, verses 12 to 21, please. Listen, listen, says Jesus, I'm coming soon. I will bring my rewards with me to give each one according to what he has done. I am the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Happy are those who wash their robes clean and so have the right to eat the fruit from the tree of life and to go through the gates into the city. But outside the city are the perverts and those who practice magic, the immoral, the immoral and the murderer, those who worship idols and those who are liars, both in words and deeds. I, Jesus, have seen any... Uh, Send my angel to announce these things to you in the church, in the churches. I am descended from the family of David. I am the bright morning star. The spirit and the pride says, Come, everyone who hears this must also say, Come. Come, whoever is thirsty, accept the water of life as a gift, whoever wants it. I, John, so long, so lonely, Warn everyone who hears the prophetic words of this book. If anyone adds anything to them, God will add to his or her punishment. The black, 
described in this book. And if anyone takes anything away from the prophetic words of this book, God will take away from them their share of the fruit of the tree of life and the holy city which are described in this book. He who gives his testimony to all says, Yes, indeed, I am coming soon. So be it. Come, Lord Jesus. May the grace, grace of the Lord Jesus be with everyone. Amen. Amen. So, the book of Revelation closes off with the Lord affirming, I am coming quickly. Just look, I am coming quickly. So, stay strong, stay firm, continue with what you're doing. And he, he, he says, you know, I'm Alpha and Omega. And he also says, verse 16, I, Jesus. So he identifies himself. Look, I am this Jesus. And I'm the one who has sent this message to John. And those who are saved are going to be part of this eternal heavenly city. Outside of the city, I mean, it's people who will, who are, you know, who rejected Christ. They will have no place in this city. And so, verse 17, the spirit and the bride say come. The spirit, which is the Holy Spirit, God, the Holy Spirit. The bride, which is the people of God, they say come. So the Holy Spirit moving on the church, moving on the people of God, cry out and say come. And it's we are anticipating, we are living with that sense of saying, Lord Jesus, come. We want you to come. We want, you know, we want what you have spoken of, the things that you've said you will do. So come, Lord Jesus. And the Holy Spirit is empowering the bride, the church, to be in the state of readiness and say, come. And then he closes by saying, you know, don't add to these words. Don't take away from these words. These are final. This is what the Lord Jesus has spoken to John, to the churches through John. Don't add to these words. Don't take away from these words. Right? And so he says, surely I am coming quickly. And then with that, he closes out this book of prophecy. All right. So that completes this course on Daniel and Revelation. We've read Daniel and Revelation, the prophetic scriptures together. And... Um, what I'm going to do in the month of April, so we, we won't have lectures from next week, no lectures on Revelation Daniel. But what I'm going to do is I'll create an assignment, assess assessments, three short assessments that basically walk us through Daniel and Revelation, the things that we've spoken of and discussed. Uh, it will be a way for you to review, open up the Bible and just go through it as you answer the questions and it will also form the assessments based on which you will be graded, okay? It's not going to be anything difficult. It's just going to be more of like a, a way for us to revise everything, Daniel and Revelation, just take you through it. And then, you know, you will have plenty of time to um, do the exercises, well, basically the month of April, uh, to do it and you know, submit it back online in Google Classroom or for those who are doing it in the e-learning portal, you can submit it in the e-learning portal, okay? So next week, you will be receiving an email to let us know how you want to graduate, uh, whether you'll be coming in person or whether you will just be joining us online so that we can prepare accordingly for your graduation, uh, which will happen on Sunday, the 8th of May. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, everyone, you know, all of you will, will graduate, of course, but... Uh, we just need to know whether you're going to come physically or you will join us online so we can be prepared for that. Okay. Um, we will close here today. Thank you for being part of this course. Thank you for studying with us. And, uh, you know, let us know about your plans for the ministry, what you plan to do uh, after your graduation. If you need any help, you need any guidance, uh, please uh, just drop an email uh, and, you know, we would be happy to respond. Okay. Let's close in prayer.
Any questions, any comments? Okay. All right. Okay. Good. Let's um, pray together and we will wrap this up. Um, who'd like to pray the closing prayer? All right. Thomas, why don't you? Pastor, or... uh, and I was about to say. Uh, this is our final class. You can pray and bless us. The word of prayer. That will okay. be nice. I will do that. I will do that. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this journey over the last several weeks and months that uh, we could journey together through your holy word as we read chapter by chapter. Thank you, Lord, for understanding and for truth. Father, I pray over all the students who are part of this class or part of the e-learning course. And uh, Lord, even as we bring this semester to a close and this course, I pray a blessing on each one. I pray especially for those who will be graduating and moving into uh, different roles in ministry. Father, we pray your wisdom. We pray your guidance upon them. We pray that each one, Lord, will take all the learning, all the equipping, and put it to good use for your kingdom as they serve, as they minister to people. Uh, may there be much fruit in their lives. Uh, may there be much grace. May there be much wisdom, much anointing flowing through their lives as they serve others, Lord. And may your work be done through them. And Lord, all of us, we pray that we will I live faithful to you till our very end so that God together we will be in that new city in that heavenly Jerusalem looking at your face glorifying you thank you Father in Jesus mighty name Amen 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 thank you so much Pastor thank you each thank one you, Pastor. I appreciate you um, being part of the course God bless. We will be in touch. Man. Thank you.